Okay, um, so as explained, I'm a licensed psychologist. Um, I'm on contract with MHN, who many of you have MHN as your EAP provider. And when I use the term EAP, in this case, we're talking about employee assistance program. Notice it was the same um, for emergency action, action plan. So um, I have a background in working with law enforcement, and I, ha I do several things for MHN. I do these trainings. I also am one of the people that if you utilize the employee assistance program, you might be given my name among others. And I also participate in their military family life consultant program where we are flown all over the world to different military bases to support our active duty members and their families. So um, they've sent me to Japan and England and Germany and so forth. So I have a broad background in working with critical incidents and if I can answer questions afterwards, we're uh, a little bit pushed for time during this, but I wanted to start today by, um, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to actually read to you for about three minutes, because after this uh, Sandy Hook incident, I was very moved by this particular viewpoint that was in the B, and I don't know if all of you saw it. Sacramento is a long way from Newtown, Connecticut. Even so, there may be causes to the Sandy Hook elementary tragedy that are nearby closer than one might think. It's natural to go in search of causes. We want to know why and then to fix it. We sleuth for causes and among our favorite villains, depending on our bias, the NRA, perhaps the liberal judges, or the movie violence. But the deeper cause, indeed the cause of causes, is supremely local. It is the human heart, our nature, this is how the setting for Sandy Hook is in a way shared by Sacramento or Wichita, Miami, Spokane, or anywhere actually. As we rise to act on the horror 3,000 miles away, we dare not avoid reflecting on the causes that reside in our very natures in a spot just a few inches behind our eyes. I realize that by the common word heart, I could also use the word soul. I refer to something that at first seems too unspecific to fix. By this word, I refer to our values, choices, relationships, and practices. I refer to honesty, compassion, and the balance between individuality and community. And I do not mean to infer that some lack of heart in Connecticut is to blame there. I am referring now only to the wider culture and our responsibilities in it. <coughs> The social fabric is frayed, and each of us is one thread in particular. And we have become, I have become, insulated and unconcerned for its integrity. So I blame when I should look within. And what do I find within? If I'm honest, I see my comfortable and my accepted hatreds, my limited affections, and my consumption of entertainments that distract me from those who might try my patience or exhaust my interest. Now take this narcissism and multiply it over all of us, over the millions of us. In its full flower, we see a kind of moral abdication. We have turned our cry for independence into the demand to be left alone. We then create huge bureaucracies that will care where I will not or cannot, and then some of us complain, rightly I think, that those bureaucracies are too large and too costly. If we saw this abdication, this vacuum, and understood its negative power, we would repent. We would turn from our ways and meet our neighbors, learn the names of their kids, and watch for their safety on the streets. We would bring meals when neighbors' grandparents pass away and ask to see pictures of their vacations, pray for their teenage daughter when they run away. We would volunteer. We would repent uh, of the most insidious judgments where we have called others wackos or flyover people, lefties or hicks. We would stop all that and weave a new fabric. History gives us a few examples of such spiritual and cultural re reformation, such as America's Great Awakenings, which contributed to public sentiment about slavery. Or on a smaller scale, and more recently, we can point to a grassroots effort like Mothers Against Drunk Driving. 
The force of law comes to bear on these examples, outlawing slavery and increasing punishments for drunken driving. But the foundational reassessment was at first a matter of the public soul and continues to be. The tragedy was even more than an injury to us. It was an affront. The killer shamed us. He shamed our community and our humanity. One of our members spited us. He snuck under our instruction and avoided our scruples. He defied us or perhaps ignored us. We moved to bring justice for this affront, yes. But what are we learning about ourselves? We think, how could this happen? Like a fix-it person who's certain the problem must be out there, like a broken fuse in a circuit. We fail to look inwardly. Most of the discussions after Sandy Hook is about blame and not introspection. Rather than shame on us, the message uh, is the shame on the NRA, on the court against prayer, on the Reagan era disinvestment of community mental health practices, or on video games or movies. But I think we, and the way we live, is more at the heart of the matter than we want to admit. In the words of the late Pogo cartoonist, Walt Kelly, we have met the enemy and he is us. So I wanted to start with that today because I found it very thought provoking. It was in Viewpoint Sacramento B on January 5th. And I found it very, very thought provoking in terms of looking at the whole psychological aspect of this horrible tragedy that triggered your meeting today. Um, So one of the things that we want to be prepared for is the psychological aspect of a tragedy that could come your way. Some of these might include sudden death, which is, can be an unexpected death or a death that occurs um, within hours of the onset of symptoms. It could be a traumatic death, which is sudden and unanticipated. A traumatic death is usually violent, mutilating, or destructive. And it can also be random and or preventable. The sudden death shatters the world that we live in, what we've come to know as things that we can expect day to day, hour to hour, is shattered completely. And the aftermath can be very traumatic for people. Sudden loss is the loss that occurs without any forewarning. In an instant, life is forever changed. Accidental loss, often a body injury caused by an accident, and that might have a different impact. If you think about these different kinds of loss and how you would react to them, a traumatic event is an event or series of events that causes severe stress reactions. So sudden, accidental, or traumatic death might be heart attack, stroke, ruptured aneurysm, accident, suicide, homicide, Sudden infant death, natural disasters such as Katrina or the tsunami, or human-caused disasters such as September 11, Oklahoma City, or Sandy Hook. Each of these leaves survivors bereaved, stunned, unable to function at times. Um, as the officer was saying, uh, some people that he thought would be able to step up and help out in the crisis were hiding under the desk and people he least expected were able to step forward. And that's not surprising because we react to this shock in very different ways. And some people go on to develop full post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the things that we've learned from research is that it's often a very good idea to have a critical incident stress debriefing um, within 72 hours of these traumatic incidents. Um, if you have MHN as your provider, they uh, provide this, and uh, Renee Holly is here today. If you need to know more about that service provided through MHN, you can contact her afterwards. During, um, so some of the normal reactions that people have during a trauma are behavioral, cognitive, emotional, and physical. And so you won't be surprised by any of these, I'm sure. The behavioral ones include withdrawal and isolation, a decreased motivation, and decreased communication. Emotional fear, anxiety, anger, depression, sadness, okay? 
and reduced concentration, reduced decision making, indecisiveness, and increased psychosomatic complaints. If any of you have been around a person that's starting to develop these normal reactions, and you may have wondered at what point does it become a good idea to refer, refer this person to a professional. Any ideas on when that might be? When would you look at these kinds of symptoms as normal and then start to say to yourself, this person is troubled a little bit beyond that? Because some of these kinds of normal reactions can in fact be the background of some of the active shooters. Is that dawned on anyone? The withdrawal, the isolation. So sometimes we find these kinds of folks have been traumatized earlier in their lives and they've been hiding away. This fellow in Connecticut had been very withdrawn from people. Okay. So at what point in your role in, as, in ed, as educators would you say that you need to begin to think about getting somebody professionally evaluated? When does being slightly withdrawn become morbidly withdrawn? When does slightly depressed or a little out of sync become this person <coughs> is morbidly depressed? This person has sui suicidal ideas. Any ideas? Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't know how it struck you when he said that most of these active shooters are between 13 and 20. Did, did I catch those numbers right? Between 13 and 20. These are adolescents. These are very, very young people. And those of you that are in education well know that, that at that age is when people experience what? Angst. <laughs> Angst. <laughs> Identity crisis, sexual orientation crisis, you know, are they cool, are they hip, do they fit in, okay? And so you might think, oh my goodness, all the kids in my high school are potential shooters. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, we have had a history in mental health where, where people who are in their teens are diagnosed schizophrenic or something, they're not schizophrenic at all, they're teenagers. They look so similar. <laughs> at times. So again, what I want to have you leave here with though is how do you begin to sense that it's a little bit more extreme? And the gentleman is absolutely correct. One way you would know is that they become sort of preoccupied with it. They're writing about it. They're drawing gory pictures. They're telling their friends. They're reporting to somebody that they're very lonely. They're isolated. They take up morbid interests. They thoroughly enjoy lots and lots of violent games and videos and movies, okay? Now my question, is there anybody left in law enforcement in here? Okay, because my question is this. So let's say one of these very sensitive teachers or principals notices this, they're concerned, and they call law enforcement. What's gonna happen next? As far as a school situation, <clears throat> probably going out and talking to the kids, talking to the kids' parents, talking to and going through everything from the parents to the teachers to the students to the students' parents. So it, it would be responded to, because I've had people tell me, oh, well, we were told if we hadn't done anything yet, there was nothing we could do. We hadn't acted on it. But you're saying that it would be. You know, every situation's different, but, you know, on, on a situation where I've been involved, that's what you would do. That's, that's the problem okay. <clears throat> That's good to know, and especially nowadays, I guess. We take every threat, no matter how minimal it is, very seriously. And we have a threat assessment officer who's a sergeant with the sheriff's department who actually does a threat assessment to determine whether or not there's a potential for credibility there. So we look at it, <coughs> no matter how small it is, we, we pay very serious attention to it um, and try to protect whoever the person is that's making maybe a threat, as well as the students and the staff and the parents. Right. Okay, excellent. So that's good to know, because if we sit here and say to you, come on, let's sharpen our tools, let's, let's sew our fabric back together, let's be a little bit more in tune with what's going on around us and how our children are being raised, 
we want to know that if we do make that phone call that somebody's going to respond and, and go out and do something about it. But it's not like sometimes in the past where that wouldn't have happened. Um, is there not an intermediary uh, action or uh, would there be something within the school and if you noticed a youngster was drawing on the papers or standing in the hallway that this kid did? Yes, I think, I think the gentleman earlier talked about kind of escalating within the system before involving. Exactly. Do you go immediately to police? I, I think the recommendation that was made earlier was to exhaust the internal kind of chain of command, if you will, and then bring in external. I don't know if anyone disagrees with that. I, my fear when I look at situations like this mm -hmm. is that so many of us take that attitude of somebody else will get involved. You know, somebody else will do it. Or I don't want to overreact. Gee, you know, now we've had Sandy Hook, and so every kid that's drawing a hangman is going to get summoned before the police. Um, it's very, it's a very tight rope to walk, isn't it? Between overreacting and underreacting. Personally, I'd rather that we overreact for a while. <laughs> you know, what's the worst that can happen is that. The, the police go and question the child and the family and maybe he gets counseling. Good. One thing that I've noticed about all of these tragic situations is that somebody knew in advance that these people were planning their episodes. What a shame that it couldn't have been prevented. And, and some of them will not be prevented. But if we can even prevent a few with this increased knowledge and sensitivity. So teenagers are especially filled with angst. They are difficult to assess in terms of their mental health issues. But those of you who've been around this age group kind of have a second feel, if you will, for what's normal and what's becoming pathological. And usually your greatest indicator is preoccupation. They're becoming preoccupied with something to the exclusion of social connectedness. So what happens during the grief and loss process? You may recognize this as being <coughs> Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of death and dying, and it's very similar. We go through shock and denial. If you think about your personal reactions when you heard about Sandy Hook, some of us were in shock and denial. Then we go into usually an anger, a guilt or bargaining, we're looking to blame somebody, we're trying to find out why they did this, what, where was the weak link, who's to blame, what kind of a mother was this, having guns in her house, etc., etc. And then there's a depression and an acceptance. And then we start scrambling to try to prevent it from happening again. And I think that the prevention is part of the social fabric as well. Um, as I was planning to do this presentation today, I thought, you know, the people I'm going to be addressing are probably the most sensitive, sewn together people <laughs> that least need to be reminded of this. Because I know that people in education are, are often most aware of what's going on on the day to day basis in families' lives. But it's a good reminder to all of us. So what are some of the uh, specific challenges that are faced by the loss and the grieving process? What does it trigger? And you're going to see that shattering of the world as you assume it to be is a number one. If you are dealing with children or adults who've had a profound loss, they start to doubt their perception of reality. How, how could they have missed this? What could they have done differently? Uh, did they follow the recommendations that were given to them at that workshop on Tuesday in January? 
Could they have done something different? The whole world as you assume it to be is questioned. The intensified grief response that follows is often the failure of an ability to say goodbye, to reach closure with somebody that you cared about. Um, people are forced to face the loss of a loved one when, when they were making Christmas preparations, for example. Um, there can be multiple losses, losses of an individual person, that person's friends. Um, all of these things are worsened by the public coming in. The officer mentioned how the media arrives so quickly and invades the privacy of many of these fam families. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice after tragedies like this is that many people start to doubt their religious beliefs and their personal priorities come into question. People will change their careers, change where they live. They suddenly realize how finite life can be and they start to make big, big changes. And then of course there can be tremendous legal and financial issues that come from it as well, any of these crises. So what can you do in your role? Well, you can ensure safety to as great a degree as you can by being prepared. That's why you're here today. You can offer critical incident stress debriefings if you have access to people that can do that for you. And there are many people trained nowadays to provide that. Um, recognize the different reactions. If you have um, staff members that are starting to uh, drift apart from the group after an incident, or some that are becoming kind of bossy, different character reactions. Um, sometimes people get specific symptoms. I worked with a soldier once who was just back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and the poor kid had uh, chronic hiccups, just hiccuping away. And he'd been to all the medical folks, and nobody could figure out why he was hiccuping away. And I said to him, well, let's talk about your time over there a little bit. Let's start with the, you get up in the morning, you shave, then what happens? Oh, well, you know, we're fine, he said to me. We all came back fine. There were no injuries in my group. We're, we're fine. I said, good, but just keep telling me about that day. Oh, well, so then you're in the middle of shaving and one of these little missiles comes over. <laughs> oh. Gosh, that would, that would make me jolt. So we began to go through the day, and of course this kid, without realizing it, had been exposed to things that were outside the range of normal human experience. He was tough, he was a soldier, he was, he was told that everything was fine, we all came back intact. That's great, except he was scared to death. He was 19 years old and absolutely scared to death. So guess what happened to his hiccups by him associating that he was terrified with these hiccups? Hmm? They went away. One session. One session. Oh, he was embarrassing after that. He'd come over and hug me and kiss me in public. It was awful. <laughs> it was awful. You want to adjust workplace expectations if there's a tragedy? in your world so that a person can get back to work at the rate that they can get back to work. And encourage your employees to seek professional help, EAP, again, this one meaning Employee Assistance Program. It's funny that they have the same acronym, isn't it? Emergency Action Employee Assistance. Okay, allow time to feel and understand the loss, help people to find appropriate support, and maintain physical well-being, maintain realistic expectations. There's research on how to respond to critical incidents nowadays. Um, in earlier times, they thought it was best that people talk about the incident in detail and go into the bloody gory details. We're now not so sure that that's the best way to approach it. So if you have an incident and you want help, make sure that the people are properly trained in critical incident stress debriefing. Uh, just because someone's a therapist or a psychologist does not mean that they are current on all of that. So you want to make sure. So
so part of what you can do, part of what anyone can do, you don't need to be a psychologist to do this, is listen and provide emotional support. You listen to what was traumatic for that particular person. Okay? You listen to their version of the events that took place. And you provide not only emotional support, but physical support in the here and now. If you ever have an incident, and you know, let's say the call is made, it's all clear, you can come out of lockdown, you're gonna wanna make sure that people have something to sit on, that they have water to drink, that there's physical and emotional support available. Those kinds of immediate here and now <coughs> interventions have been associated with healthier recovery from trauma. Just very, very basic. Can I make a phone call for you? Is there anyone that you would like notified? And these kinds of things help people with their recovery. Providing reassurance, being patient, Oh, that one's a tough one. I can't tell you how often I hear in my office people saying, well, nobody wants to hear about it anymore. Maybe nobody wants to hear about it anymore because it scares them, right? And so if somebody ever says that to you, nobody wants to hear about it anymore. You might want to encourage them to seek professional help because that professional person is going to hear about it. <laughs> They're getting paid to do so. But that is something that people run into that's very real. Um, and encourage open discussion about the event to the degree that they want to do it. I, I am not for dragging details out of people that don't want to go into their gory details. OK, so what is resilience? Resilience means that we have coped well with change. We have adapted ourselves. We have sustained our health and energy when under pressure. And these are just kind of some practical things like continuing an exercise plan, continuing to be careful with your sleep patterns, what you're eating, um, that you're a person that can bounce back from setbacks. You can overcome adversity and change to a new way of thinking. Now, the thing is, that all sounds great, but if somebody tells you your little six-year-old's just been murdered by a madman, um, th these things are going to become very, very difficult to do. You're not going to be able to sleep, you're not going to be able to eat appropriately, and you're not going to be able to, to function. And so those around you are going to want to help with very particular things. Maybe they're going to want to offer childcare for your other kids while you're in this state of stun. Or they may want to bring over meals or they may want to drive you to the therapist's office that you need to see or the doctor's office for sleep medication or what have you. So a lot of what people need in that period where they're not feeling so resilient is very, very practical <coughs> help. We're back to that fabric of society <laughs> where people look out for each other, right, in very practical ways. So. One of the things that we know is that suicide is 1.3% um, of all deaths are from suicide. Wait, that's not where I want to be. Um, uh, one suicide occurs every 17 minutes in this country. It's kind of amazing. And it's usually the most vulnerable, a young person age 15 to 24 dies by suicide every two hours. And the most vulnerable is older men over the age of 80. That's something? That's the most vulnerable age group for that. 